as we walk in one by one, a living testimony of what the Lord has done. Empty, broken vessel, the only grace could feel. Count the spending hearts and lives that only God could heal. I'm 
And once you can start to get in the mind, and he, the mind begins to get in you of what he's trying to say to us, man, that's a blessing. We're going to talk about slavery. Can anybody tell me what a slave is? Owned by another person. We here in America, we went through this period of time when we brought people from Africa. We bought them, sold them, traded them, and they were slaves. And can anybody tell me what a thief is? Or a robber? Somebody that steals. And can anybody tell me what a brother is? Or a sister. All right, you can have two ways. It can be flesh, if you're born of the same parents, or it can be spiritual, if you're born of a spiritual birth. Now, this particular is one of Paul's shortest writings. Uh, it's just one page in your Bible. And it, he writes to Philemon, and where he's writing from is in prison. Now, most Paul's life, he never, uh, his evangelizing, his missionary journey, and his pastoring, they never did send him money to come. He never preached in an inside auditorium with pews nor a pulpit. Most of his preaching was done in houses, in the streets, from jail. But he never quit preaching and teaching the Word of God. He was faithful to his call. So I want you to look in the 17th and 18th verses. But we're going to go through the entire book. It won't take very long uh, to preach this. But the 17th and the 18th verses. But thou count me therefore a partner. Receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee oft, put it on my account. Now, Philemon was a born-again believer of Christ Jesus. And the reason that he had gotten saved, it's because that Paul had gone to the city where that he was, uh, Colossus, and he had preached the gospel there. Philemon was a businessman. Besides being a businessman, he was very rich. And besides that, he owned slaves. In the days of Paul and, and the New Testament, it, many people owned slaves. If you go back in the Old Testament, Israel, God's people, were in captivity to Egypt for 430 years, and they were slaves. Now, I've never owned a slave. My parents never owned a slave. And as far as I know, my grandparents never owned a slave. But just maybe somewhere back in our family, maybe somewhere back in your family, somebody owned slaves. But now you've got to remember that everything that is applied physically, that we apply physically, God takes and applies it spiritually. So Paul opens up with this epistle. Now, when he was writing this letter, he was in Rome, and he was in jail, and he was in chains. Now, most of us, if we had been in prison for preaching or teaching and living a Christian life, we'd be moaning and groaning and complaining and saying, why God me? I love you. I've been born again. I'm living for you. And why would you put me through this? Well, you've got to remember that Paul had an adversary called the devil. And we have an adversary called the devil. And our lives are going to be tested. They're going to be tried. And we're going to have problem after problem after problem. Now, there are some preachers that's going to tell you, all you've got to do is get saved and you're just going to... Go along and everything's going to be smooth. That's a lie that's been puked out of the pits of hell by the devil. I've not found my life like that. Neither have you. Amen? Amen. It hasn't been like that. So when Paul opens up this letter and begins to write, 
He said that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. A prisoner. Now, him being a prisoner is in this fashion. It was his choice to get saved. It was his choice to preach the gospel. It was his choice to serve God and to tell other people. So by his choice, he became obligated and he obligated himself not because of God but because of what God had done for him he obligated himself to be uh, led by the Spirit of God and to be moved by the Spirit of God and to do God's work he became a prisoner now he said he was not only a prisoner there in the Roman jail but Timothy was also and then when he begins to write he says that Timothy was his dearly beloved brother. And so he opens up and he writes to Philemon. This is in the first verse. He says, dearly beloved and fellow labor. Now, when he went to Colossus and preached the gospel, Philemon got saved. And the church began in Colossus. <laughs> and then he writes, uh, uh, Alphaea. Alphaea was... Philemon's wife. Now, I want you to notice something. They were having church. Their place of worship was in Philemon's house. And Alphaea was the wife of Philemon. So Paul is going to include her in the letter that he's going to write. Because this letter that he's going to write them is going to get tough. And so he's included her. Now, if they've had in church in Philemon and Alphaeus' house, she's the one that did the cleaning. She's the one that prepared the meals. So he is including her in along with her husband to, <clears throat> to try to lead and show them in what direction they needed to go. And then it talks about a Christmas. And this man, I, what I gather, I can't prove it. I believe that he was either the pastor or he was a leader in the church. And the church was not a building with a steeple, with pews, but it was in their homes. Now, it's hard for us to imagine. They had no sign out front saying that they were Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran. They didn't have a sign saying welcome. Everything that was done as far as promoting Jesus Christ was done by mouth. So Paul had preached to Philemon. He had preached to his wife. Uh, he, had, he had preached to our Christmas. And he calls them fellow laborers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then from the fourth verse down through the seventh verse, he talks about praying. Paul said, I thank God for you always. I keep in mind in my prayers to God for you. Uh, and he said, I hear something. I'm praising God for you. I hear something. I hear about the love and the faith. This is in the fifth verse. The love and the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. He said, Philemon, I'm, I'm thrilled. Alphaea, I'm filled. Or Christmas, I'm filled with love because of what you are doing. You've got love toward everyone, especially to the saints. Now, the word saints in the New Testament means everybody that's been born again of the Spirit of God. I'm a saint. Right. Do I look at it? No, you don't. You are a saint. Saints are born again believers. Now, I saw this week that they have, for the first time in the history of the Catholic Church, they're going to make two popes the saints. They're going to go into sainthood. But sainthood in the New Testament is everyone that's been born again of the Spirit of God. We are saints of God. And uh, sixth verse, he talks about communication. And he was, he was <coughs> commending Philemon on his communication of faith. He was sharing what Jesus had done for him. He was telling other people. So you and I can do that too. We can tell people what Jesus has done for us. What has He done for us? 
He has saved our wretched souls from hell. He has forgiven us of our sins. And we are assured that we have a home in heaven. So he was sharing his faith with them. And then he goes on to say uh, that it may become a, a factual acknowledging of every good work which is in you. Now, pay, this is in the sixth verse, the latter verse part of it. And every good work, good thing that is in you. What's the next word? Yeah. In. What's the next word? Right. Christ Jesus. So he's saying every good thing that you're saying about the saints and every good thing that is in you is in Christ Jesus. And because you've received Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus is in you. Amen. Now, but that's a good place to have a spell. Right. There's nothing good about me. There's nothing good about you. <laughs> The only thing good about it is that we have Christ living in us. And when we do what He wants to do, wants us to do, it magnifies God. So I have nothing good. The only thing good is Jesus that lives in me. And then the seventh verse. He says, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the vows. I want you to underline the word vows. We'll find it three different times here. Bowels means heart. Heart. When you talk about anything that's inward, it talks about the bowels of the earth. It's inward. So what's in us is the heart, the love of God. And he goes on to say, what is in your heart is of the saints and refreshed, refreshed by thee, brother. Because he has taught it, because he has preached it, because he has lived it, it has uplifted the saints. So what you do, what you say, how you walk, how you live, it affects the people that are in the church. Right. That's a good place to hop. Right. If you're a backbiter, it affects us all. If you're a complainer, it affects us all. But if you have love, peace, joy, contentment, and willing to lift up others, pray for others, put others before you, man, that's a blessing. So, now Paul is crafty. Or I won't say Paul is crafty, but the Holy Spirit that's inspiring him to write this is very when you pay close attention to it. Because what he has done in the beginning of these first seven verses, he is commending everything that they're doing, they're doing right. He's telling them the way you're living is the way you ought to live. He's saying, I'm proud of you. Man, you've got this thing down right. But now the Holy Spirit and Paul speak and drop the bomb on. And this bomb's not a pleasant one. Eight verse. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to endure that which is convenient. Now all that verse is saying is, I could order you. Well, I don't take orders very well, do you? I could order you to do what I'm going to tell you to do. But instead of me ordering you to do it, I'm going to tell you what you should do because of the love that Christ has in you. So everything that you and I do as Christians should be from God in His will in an operation from God. Now let me say this. <clears throat> I like to be forgiven. <laughs> I really do. Because I mess up so many times. And I just pray to God that when I mess up, people will forgive me for my mess ups. But now here's the thing about it. I want to be forgiven. You want to be forgiven. But then we go a little further. This is what we say. You got me one time and I'm going to forgive you. 
But if you get me again, well, let me ask you. Jesus said, one time, forgive your brother. But after that one time, don't you forgive him anymore. Did I get that wrong? Did you get it wrong? Come on! Did you get it wrong? Do you know I forgave them and they came back and did the same thing to me again? Now I'm not going to forgive that and I'm not going to overlook it. I'm going to tell everybody what they've done so everybody will know what they've done. How many times did Jesus say that we ought to forgive? Whew, now, how many times is that? I can't multiply that high. In a day. <laughs> Jesus is saying, hey, it makes no difference what anybody does to you. You've got to forgive it, forgive it, forgive it, forgive it, forgive it, forgive it, forgive it. You ever had trouble with your husband? Had trouble with your wife? Had trouble with your kids? Had trouble with your mom and dad? Had trouble with people around you? Trouble with people in the church? You're not going to get me again. What we're doing is building a wall up and saying, God, forgive me, but I'm not going to forgive them. <coughs> we ought to give the invitation right there. And every pew ought to be empty. And everybody ought to be on their face before God. But let me tell you, we are a stubborn people. We will amen. We will acknowledge what's right. We will shout what's right. But we don't want to react and do what's right. See, this applies to everybody but crow. <laughs> <coughs> Did I get that wrong? Yeah. How about your name? How about putting your name in? It applies to everybody but you. Because this is what we say. You don't know what they did to me. We need to go through and tear a bunch of pages out of this Bible because they're offensive. This thing says some things that we just don't want to live by. Right. Amen. Boy, it's good preaching. Amen. That is good stuff. He said, I'm not going to order you to do this, but I'm going to ask you to do what is right. Now, here we go. Ninth verse. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged. Now that's literally translated Paul the old. This is an old man that's in chains, that's in prison in Rome, and he's writing to Philemon, his wife, and another leader in the church. And now also a prisoner of Jesus. He not only is in prison in chains, but through his own confession of accepting Christ, he's a prisoner of God. Tenth verse, here it comes, the whole message. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bond. Now Onesimus was a slave and he was a slave to Philemon. Boy, this is going to get interesting. Onesimus, a slave. A slave unto Philemon. Now he was in Rome. Now he was in jail with Paul. That don't make any sense at all. 
But he's writing to Philemon. And so he that's in chains, he's, Paul said, Onesimus is my son. Well, I didn't think Paul had any children. He didn't. Paul was never married. But he was his son because he presented Jesus Christ to him. And Onesimus took Christ as his Savior. And he became a son to Paul. Because he preached and he begot him with the gospel. So in it, the one that presented you the gospel, how do you feel toward him? You're forever indebted to that one because of the good words that were spoke to you. That, that they received Christ as their personal Savior. 11th verse, which in times past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. <coughs> Now, if you had a slave and Paul writes to you and says that he was not profitable to you while he was at your house serving your tables, working in your fields, you would take objection to that. You would say, I would say, I own that guy. And when I said go, he went. When I said come, he came. When I said work, he worked. What do you mean that he was not profitable? You remember, you can't think in the flesh. You've got to think in the spirit. Now, in prison, he preached, Paul preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. Onesimus got saved. Paul says... <coughs> He's not profitable unto you. But now he is profitable. What he received in prison, Jesus Christ, is going to make him somebody that can be a, a benefit. He said he is profitable to me, and now he is profitable to you. Can anybody tell me what Onesimus means, the meaning of it? Like this in your Bible. Profitable. That's what it means. Now this man that was a slave is going to become profitable. Paul said that he's profitable to me where I'm at here in prison. And he's going to be profitable for you where you're at. 12th verse. For I have sent again thou thou forth receive him that is my own vows. Now he says, I'm sending him again. And you receive him just like he was me because he is dear to my own vows, my own heart. I preached, he received, he got saved, and now he's one of us. He preached to Onesimus. He preached to Philemon. He preached to Althea. He preached to our, our, our chippers, and those became brothers. Now let's think, who was Onesimus? He is a slave. He was owned by Philip, but he didn't like being a slave. So the first thing he thought, I'm not going to be a slave. I'm fixing to lie to shuck and get out of here. So what he did, he went in and stole from Philip. And he ran off. But after he ran off and got to Rome, he did something and they put him in prison. But they put him in prison with Paul and Paul preached and he got saved. Now Paul is writing a letter going to give it to Onesimus and Onesimus is going to go back to his owner and present the letter. If Paul had said that to me, I'd said, are you crazy? Do you think I lost my ever-loving mind? I ran off from him. And you think I'm going to go back with this little old piece of paper? What's that going to do for me? 
Now let's stop for a minute. Have you ever been a slave? Or are you a slave? If you've never been saved, you are a slave. You are a slave to sin. And even though you don't want to sin, and even though you want to do the right thing, it's not in you to do the right thing. Now we think, as he thought, I don't want to be a slave for what I'm going to do. I'm going to steal something and run. Let's say today, and I've done this many times in my life before I got saved. I thought what I needed to do. We were living in Carroll, Illinois, and I, I got in some problems and some trouble there. And I thought what I needed to do is get away from Carroll because if I got away from Carroll, I would leave all my problems behind. And so we moved to Michigan. And you know what? After about two to four weeks, that same guy that I left in Carroll, that same guy that I left the problems over there, that cat followed me up there. And here I was. Only thing I did was change zip code. The guy that I was here is the same guy that I was there. Well, I'm going to change. I want to get me a new husband, a new wife. <coughs> you better get me a new you. Because that's not your problem. I'm going to get a new house, a new car, new clothes. That's not your problem. Your problem is you. You're letting slavery because you are a... You say, how did I ever get to be a slave to sin? Our mom and daddy, Adam and Eve. Right. That's where it happened. Because when they sinned, it chained our genes forever. So when we're born, when our mother gives us birth, we are born sinners and we are born in sin. Right. Now there's a protection there. God does not judge and send to hell and condemn little children. But He does this. When a person gets to the age that they know right from wrong and they know what sin is, they're coming to the age that they're going to make an, a, give an account to God for themselves. <coughs> Mom, Dad, you cannot answer for your children. Children, you cannot answer for your mom and dad. That's each of us must give an account before God of what we do with Him in this world. So Onesimus has got him a letter. He's a saved slave. And now he's going back to Philip. Twelfth verse. I have sinned again. Thou therefore receive him that is my own vows, whom I, I would have retained with me, but in, in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel, but without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but of willing. Boy, it gets better. Paul said, he's saved. I'm writing a letter. I'm sending it back to you. And he said, I would keep him here because he is profitable. Onesimus means profitable. He's profitable unto me because he's doing the work that glorifies God. I'm doing the work that glorifies God. And so that will help me. But he said, I can't do this because you did not give me consent to do this. And I'm not going to order you to do this. But I want you to do it willingly. When he gets there, if you want to take him and send him back to me, that's fine. But I'm not going to keep him here because that's not my decision to make. There are some things that are going to have to be rectified. So I'm 
sending him back. I'm sending a letter. And this is what I want you to do. 15th verse. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. I want you to underline the word forever in your Bible. Forever. He said, Philemon, he was a slave. And maybe the reason that he departed is because that he might be sent back to you. That he might be with you forever. Now we're slaves to sin. We run from our sin. We try to make amends for our sin. But there comes a time when we've got to face our sin. So Philemon in this position that he's in now, he would be like God. <coughs> When Jesus saves us, He gives us eternal life, and eternal life is forever. So He's sending Him back to where uh, Philemon was. 16th verse, but now as a servant, now as a servant, the word servant means slave. Paul said He saved. But he's a saved slave. <coughs> but what Paul says next is, it blows my mind. But he says, but above a slave. He's a slave. But he's more than a slave. The latter part of that verse, next part said, a brother beloved. He is a slave. He ran off. He stole from you. He got in prison. I was in prison. I preached the word. He got saved. I'm sending him back as a slave. But he is above a slave. Now what made him get above a slave? Jesus. The bonds were broken. He was free from his sin. He said, this is what I want you to do. He is your brother. Boy, that changes the complexion of it all. Now he's my brother. A brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now he said, when you had him, he was a slave and had no freedom. But now I'm sending him back. And now he is a brother to you in the Lord. Now he's going to help you in the church. He's going to do the work of God and be a laborer, a fellow laborer. He is your brother in Christ Jesus. Now what makes us brothers or sisters? Say mom and dad. That's flesh. Spiritually speaking, having the same Father born again of the Spirit of God. So if you have received Christ as your Savior, now we're brothers, we're sisters in Christ Jesus. I, I'm hurrying. I know some of you get hot and sleep. I'm going at it as hard as I can. Man, this is this. Have you ever, you ever heard anybody preach on Philip? I never have. I've never heard it in my life. I don't know where old crow's been all these years. I just thought because it was a little short epistle, it didn't mean anything. I didn't think it had any bite in it. I didn't think it had any power in it. But boy, it's just done got some power and bite in it. 17th verse. But if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Now Paul said, Philip. If you and I are brothers and are partners and partakers in Christ Jesus, when He gets back there, you receive Him into your house and into your love and into your arms just like it was me. Now, but that's a tough thing. 
You think I'm going to take somebody that's a slave that I owned and I'm going to elevate him to brothership and I'm going to love him and receive him just like Paul? Now, I'm going to, I hope I don't offend any of you, but I'm going to give you some truth. I grew up in this county, grew up in the country. Wycliffe being the county seat. If you go into Wycliffe from Barlow, it's up high on a hill. When I was growing up, the nice homes was up on the hill. And the further you got down, I don't know whether this is correct or not, but the less nicer they got. Till you got down to what they call the flat. Oh. Y'all ever hear about the flat? No. Where are you? Yep, the flat. Now the people that lived up on the hill in the better homes looked down their noses at the people that lived in the flat. They thought, well I hope none of you lived on the hill. <laughs> they thought that they were better because they lived on the hill and had a better home than those that lived in the flat. At least that's what I was told. <laughs> we were from the country and we were lower than the people in the flat. <laughs> but I want to view this spiritual. If you've never committed an audible sin that anyone has ever known, if you've always given to the poor, if you've never been unkind and been kind to everybody in this world, what is the difference between you and someone that is a thief and a liar and a cheat? What's the difference? You're both going to hell. You're unforgiven. There's no way into the presence of God except for Jesus Christ. So here is a man that owns a business, Philip. Here is a man that's rich and has everything and owns slaves. And I assume that he thinks that he might be better than Onesimus, which is his slave. And Paul said, when he gets back there, you take him in your house just like you take me. Man, that's part of the stuff. Yeah. And let me say this before we go on. If you get saved today, you have every right and every privilege that I have. <laughs> At that moment, you have the privilege and the right to worship God. The right and privilege to pray. The right and privilege to expect of God everything that I expect of God. The right and privilege to read His Word. The right and privilege to assemble. The right and privilege to testify. The right and privilege to be the child of God. Even though this would be your first day in Christ. No seniority in Christ. No tenure in Christ. When you're born again, you have every right and every privilege a 50-year-old Christian does. Amen. 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 So that's what he's saying uh, to Philip. Seventeenth verse. But if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Eighteen. If he that hath wronged thee, or owe thee aught, oh, I love this, put it on my account. Knowing that when he sends Philip, sends <coughs> him back to Philip, that he doesn't have any money, but yet he stole from him. And here's the love of God. He said, if he owes you anything, you put it on my feet. Who does that sound like? God. Jesus. Jesus atoned for our sins. He reconciled us back to God. He forgave us of our sins. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. 
So he sends him back with a letter to the man that owned him, told him to elevate him, not from a, not leave him as a slave, but to elevate him to, as a brother in Christ Jesus. 19th verse, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. If he stole a thousand dollars, put it on my account. If he stole a million dollars, put it on my account. This is what Jesus gave to me. Glenn Crow, you're a slave. You're nothing. You are a thief. Now I'm thinking hit this lick or two and then we'll be done quick. Don't raise your hand. How many thieves? Do we have? How many of you have ever stolen anything? How many of you have ever robbed? But that's so can. But we're going to, I'm going to show you in a minute, or God's going to show you in a minute, that you are a thief and that you are a robber. Onesimus was a thief and he was a robber. Paul preached, God forgave, he sent him back. Paul said, if he owes you anything, I got the money. Now that's pretty brazen. <laughs> because how did he have the money being chained up in jail? He had faith in God. Somewhere along the line, God picked and gave him the money, and he's going to take care of Onesimus when he got back to Philip. <laughs> you know, I don't know how they named these people all these names. <laughs> when, <laughs> when I first uh, started reading this, uh, a Christmas, I thought it was a cereal. Doesn't that sound, kind of sound like a Christmas? Doesn't that sound like a, a cereal to you? <laughs> I told Barbara, I said, I sure am glad I was born in, in America. Because I'd never get through all them names. I know I couldn't spell them. Yeah. Much less even pronounce them. I will repay, albeit I, I do not say to thee how thou owest. Unto me, even thy own self besides. Oh, oh. Paul said, I'm not going to remind you that you owe me. Did Philemon owe Paul money? No. What he owed him was that God saved Paul. God called Paul, and Paul, he went to the city where Philemon was, preached the word of God, and Philemon got saved and became a brother of Paul. And he said, yeah, wait a minute, I told you what to do with Onesimus, but... If he owes you, put it on my account. But by the way, I preached to you. And I told you that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. I told you that he would save your soul. I told you, you must be born again. He said, there's a little deadness there. Pretty bold, didn't he? Right. All right. We're finished. Right. 20th verse. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh me. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Bowels means heart. Let me feel that joy. Let me rejoice in that joy because you're receiving him as a brother. Having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. He said, I've asked you to restore him. If he owes you, put it on my account. But I know this about you, Philemon. You're going to go beyond that. You're going to do more than I ask. 
All right, with this. Revelation 3.8. Jesus said that he put before us a open door. Then he says that no man could close. Then he says, I am the door. John chapter 10. I am the door. Jesus set a place before you an open door. No man can shut it. Chapter 10 of John said, I am the door. I am the door where the sheep come in. I'm the door to the, to the sheep gate where the sheep come in. Now, I told you I was going to show you where we're thieves and robbers. He said, all that ever came before me is what? Thieves and robbers. Now, what would make us thieves and robbers? Because we're trying to get to heaven some other way than going through the door of Christ. We try to be good enough. But we can't be. Three last things. He says that He atoned for our sins. And that He reconciled us back to God. And then He adopted us into the family of God. Now you and I that have been born again, and you that have not, you can be this morning, but, and, or, we will become brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus because of our Heavenly Father and the blood of Jesus Christ. We will be sisters. Now, Onesimus, was he profitable? Was he profitable? <laughs> Changed Philemon's life forever. When he got back, Philemon said, you're not a slave. Thais said, his wife, you're not a slave. You're my brother. You're my brother in the Lord. Elevation. Elevation from slavery to a thief to a brother. That's where we come. Let's stand together. <coughs>